So, today we do the really fun stuff of uh, Young Mills theories. <coughs> this is what led Sidney Coleman, the great expositor of field theories, to say that um, this seventies brought us uh, unimaginable wonders from like uh, like a different planet. So, the origin of this particular uh, topic that we are going to do today has to do with the non-linear non nature of Young Mills theory, but as we saw that non-linearity is introduced in a very specific geometric way and that is what leads to a very deep significance to uh, this theory and leads to these. Uh, effects that we are going to talk about today. So, let us begin with uh, the idea of gauge uh, transformations. So, recall that in the abelian case A mu tilde equal to A mu minus D mu of some lambda of x. Now, if this A mu is 0 to begin with, okay, if this is equal to 0, then A tilde mu is called pure gauge. this is because, so it has no it will not turn on any electro electric or magnetic fields but you might see this superfluous somebody hands you an a tilde mu and uh, you worry whether it has any gauge fields or not well two ways to check One is just to take its anti-symmetrized derivative and you should find f mu nu to be 0. I am sorry I am using this, so I will not put any tilde. So, just calculate the f mu nu of this So, this equal to 0 implies that A is pure gauge. Okay. So, if you find this, so this is the differential method, but there is an integral method. The integral method says try to solve that is uh, that is look for lambda that can satisfy this. Okay. This then you read the 
other way around and you ask whether so these are first order differential equations so d0 lambda equal to a0 d3 lambda equal to a3 are just a set of partial differential equations which are first order so you can even attempt to solve them by this well known method that you say okay therefore lambda must be equal to integral of a0 and dx0 and plus some residual uh, f of x1 x2 x3 right and so on you do for the second one you write it is integral of this but with another and then you again take the derivative so by deriving a consistency conditions on uh, edit you know in constants of integration such as we can check if the integral if a unique lambda exists. So, we want to we want lambda of course, to be sensible. So, the whole idea is uh, look for a unique lambda you know genuine space time function which is not multiple valued or etcetera. So, thus looking for Now, so you understand this mutual consider right you take derivative now you take the a 2 derivative of this lambda. So, there will be d f by d x 2 then you check that it is consistent with the d 2 equation of that and so on. So, <coughs> now reason why I am writing out all this uh, rather easy points is that there are cases in which this may not. So, firstly if you if method 1 has worked then method 2 is guaranteed to work because you know that uh, it actually is secretly d mu of some lambda and then the curl of this would be 0 because curl of gradient is 0 and if the curl is 0 then the path integral of a is uniquely defined right essentially this is a path this is a path integral of a I mean line integral of a. So, the line integral of a is uniquely defined. So, if that integral can be done uniquely in the whole plane then you get a unique lambda. So, it should be independent of the path along which you do this integration integral. So, that is ensured of course, if it is like this. Now, there are uh, there are cases in which this may not be so obvious. Uh, is that unique lambda may not exist in the sense of. So, the point is 2 is an integral method and 1 is differential method and 2 is the stronger method because it actually checks the whole plane this may be locally true, but when you check the whole plane it may not come out to be true. So, in some way so unique method may not uh, unique lambda may not exist if uh, if the space 
if the domain on which it is defined is not just R4, but something with holes in it. Okay. So, so for example, if you take the and we can only draw 3D, I mean we can visualize three axes x1, x2, x3. But suppose I exclude a cylinder along the x3 axis, I remove the x3 axis. So, I exclude this. So, I make a very non-trivial space so that the loops around this are not shrinkable. Okay. You there is the domain x is excluding this then you can get away with lambdas that are not actually unique but say differ by 2 pi and then its effect you may not detect. Okay. So, firstly it is not simply connected and say 2 pi n shifts in lambda are not detectable. So, the lesson here was that because the integral of A along any path, so this is C let us say and you are well integrating only in the x0 plane, but this is x1 and x2 plane, suppose this is x0 and you are integrating from point 1 to point 2 and this is the C. So, the point was that whether you took this path or this path or that path did not matter because you and you were in fact the fact that it turns out unique was that regardless of what path you took it should give the same answer in the end. That is not guaranteed provided there are some regions of space that are excluded then you cannot go around that okay. or if you go around you may get a different answer and then you cannot complain. But if the domain is simply connected then you can shrink all loops to 0 and then single valuedness would require that lambda cannot have any discontinuity. In a simply connected space all loops can be shrunk to 0, shrunk to a point. So, lambda cannot have any approach a unique value approach a unique value as the loop shrinks to 0. But in a non simply connected space you may be able to circumvent test number 2 because so to be specific
let us only deal with uh, 2 plus 1 dimensional space so that we do not have to draw a cylinder. And uh, 2, we have charges whose wave matter wave functions. undergo a gauge transformation And then 3, we exclude the origin. Origin is excluded, okay. We also need a fourth condition, which is that all charges are have the same charge. So, uh, there are no wave function, all wave func all the possible matter has g x equal to n times g okay where g is the basic unit and n is integer In that case, you can get away with a non-unique lambda by allowing lambda to change by 2 pi as you wind around this loop and if you change it by 2 pi, uh, 2 pi by g. So, under these assumptions, under these conditions, plus 2 pi by g times n. Okay. And therefore, lambda is multivalued, but you will never have a way of telling unless you have observables that can check this that you have gone around a loop. It turns out to be true in quantum mechanics because you have so called Bohm-Aharonov effect. So, the Bohm-Aharonov Bohm effect is in quantum mechanics, uh, remembers the presence of A mu even at the of non trivial magnetic fields at the origin. So, 
the point is that the wave function would then uh, the bohm maharano effect will be able to measure whether whether there was a uh, not, but but note that that happens because you actually have a non trivial magnetic field okay so but <coughs> this is because non trivial bz exists okay. if it did not then you could get away with uh, shifting by 2 pi n and you would not know so the example of that is in superconductors Uh, magnetic flux lines exist and <coughs> lambda is defined only up to 2 pi by e. at any point so the summary of all this is that there are things lurking around in this gauge invariance business that have to do with the global properties of the space on which you are living and their connectivity okay so the overall moral of all this is, is that thus the notion of pure gauge cannot be is not okay uh, cannot be tested easily if the space with the domain of if the domain is not simply connected now when we go to the young males case even when the space is simply connected because the gauge group is non trivial we can again have non trivial gauge fields <coughs> so non abelian case another class of exceptions due to group valuedness gauge transformations even on a simply connected domain even when dealing with a simply connected so that is the preamble and now we go to the non abelian case so uh, in the <coughs> superconductivity case the flux lines then the magnetic flux is quantized because the discontinuity because the integral a dot dl which would measure the magnetic flux it can only change in units of 2 pi by e times n 
So, the flux is quantized. Uh, Often times people say that super conductors display quantum mechanics in a bulk system, but I think that is not true. So, it has more to do with you may say that it shows that uh, a quantum field A does have a classical limit and then obeys classical gauge invariance that is what it does show, but the observable is really not really microscopic. Okay. So, uh, I mean the reasoning does not really involve quantum mechanics, it involves just classical arguments and connectivity and uh, simply connected argument. So, so long as the A mu field has a classical limit which is true for abelian fields, this is not a quantum mechanical result although there is a quantization. Okay. So, it is just a classical result. But there are other reasons why you may say it has to do with, but not this one. Okay. So, what we will do next is something quite interesting and let me write the title as the Jackie Rebi Vacua. So, now we go to the non abelian case and recall that we have that uh, a mu and now I will write a u here instead of putting tilde we will say gauge transform by u is equal to u a mu u dagger and minus i over g u d mu u dagger right. Therefore, configurations of the form are all pure gauge. So, here I should go and correct thus the notion of pure gauge can be tested, but with well so pure let us remember that by pure gauge we mean a single valued lambda okay, right, uh, but here things are going to be more subtle. So, these are so if the original a was 0 then clearly the transform one is this and we drop this u and just say that if I am handed a configuration which is constructed out of a Lie group valued map. Now, we come to the so called Jacquive Rebi observation. Let us simplify to the case where we will deal only with R 3, the space like R 3 and uh, we will look at time independent case. So, the origin of the argument is that uh, take S u 2 example. Topologically, this is same as S3. Everybody remembers why? You can construct a sequence of two spheres that go from north pole of the S3 to south pole of S3, and which are isomorphic to. So, which is And if you want, I will quickly recapitulate the argument. 
by going one dimension lower which is that uh, disk in R2 is isomorphic to S2. So, since a disk in R2, what is a disk? It is a uh, circular region including its boundary. So, that is disk and that is that can be shown to be equivalent to S2 provided you identify the outermost circle with the south pole of S2. So, what you do is you put the north pole at the center and then consider a sequence of circles going outward and at the same time on the S2 you start with north pole and start drawing these circles. When you reach the south pole, so when you reach the boundary of the disk, you map it into the south pole. So, this is, so it is not really a disk, so it is disk with boundary shrunk to a point. You can think of it in reverse you take a sphere, tear it at S2 and then flatten it out and just remember that where you tore although it became many points now you should think of it as one point. So, then you can visualize a two sphere which is intrinsically usually we embed it in 3D space can be visualized by an insect living in the disk. All he has to remember is the rule that the boundary is identified with a point. Okay. And for the same reason SU2 has which has the form cos theta by 2 times identity plus i sin theta by 2 times theta cap dot sigma or dot tau. you can do the same map. So, treat theta as definition of map theta as the radius from origin. and theta cap directions then you can see that the ball in 3D which is essentially the, the uh, map by these two right the value of the radius theta and the direction theta cap. Value of theta and theta cap they together map out all the points in this ball. Then the ball in 3D with outermost point identified with spherical surface identified with one point is same as S3 foliated as S3 
shells <coughs> and both and this construction is isomorphic to both SU2 as well as to S3. S3 because if I continue to if I continue to travel outward but at some point shrunk the outermost circle to a point it maps a homogeneous space of dimension 2. If I have a sequence of 2 spheres and I take the outermost S2 and shrink it to a point. So, outermost spherical surface S2 identified with one point then it is S3. In the case of SU2, it is the point minus 1. Minus identity. Okay. So, at theta equal to 2 pi, regardless of which direction you reach it is all equal to minus 1 right. <coughs> 